Greetings uh, to those of you who are here in the room and to those of you who join, are joining us online. Um, we are um, happy to welcome you here to American University Washington College of Law. Um, my name is uh, Michael Carroll. I'm one of the co-faculty directors of the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property along with Professor Christine Farley. Uh, we are now in our 10th year of doing uh, this Supreme Court series where we invite counsel of record and, and counsel for the friends of the court to join us uh, in cases involving intellectual property, or now we're adding technology law cases as well to the series um, to find out sort of uh, the news of the day in terms of, of the Supreme Court in our areas of law. Um, <clears throat> and, and so today we're gonna talk about the case of Gonzalez versus Google. We have a distinguished panel that I'll, I'll introduce in just a minute. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and set up the, the legal issue that the court has to, had to wrestle with today and give you a sort of substantive introduction to what the uh, legal basis for the argument will be. We'll then do a quick round of just letting the lawyers tell you what their various positions were in their briefs before the court. And then we'll spend most of the time talking about what we can and can't learn from the argument that took place this morning. Um, so this case is about... Um, uh, section 47 uh, USC to uh, section 230 of the Communications Act, which uh, provides immunity for uh, providers of interactive computer services. Um, oh, I'm sorry, one other announcement. In this, in this series, there is a related case. We'll be here uh, doing an event tomorrow at five on uh, uh, only online, so we won't be in person. Um, then we have two trademark cases coming up. Um, on March 21st and March 22nd, uh, and then we'll end this term with a, a patent case in the Amgen case. Um, okay, Section 230, uh, 1996, it's added to the Communications Act. It provides uh, protection for Good Samaritan blocking and screening of offensive material, and you can all read that very quickly. Well, no, you can't, but here, here's the basic thing. No provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker uh, of information provided by another information content provider, right? So the, some of the core questions that came up in, are what counts as an interactive computer service and when are you acting as one? What counts as being a publisher or speaker of information and what counts as being an information content provider? Uh, Congress has some answers in the, in the definitions. An information content provider is the person who is responsible in whole or in part, and that's important because it's possible a third party posts a video, the platform does something to that video. In theory, they could both be responsible for uh, the development or creation of that information, and that's one of the issues uh, that's discussed. Um, so the information content provider, the platform is only immune if it's another and if not, if they're not a co-developer. Now, what does it mean to be responsible for the development? Here, the case law has stepped in and the Ninth Circuit says that you're responsible for the development of the material if, if you're dealing with third-party content, if the uh, platform or the service provider materially contributes to the content's alleged unlawfulness. Um, so that's a fairly narrow reading. Um, and that's in, in the roommate's case. Um, and in addition, and you may hear this terminology, you are not responsible for the development if what the platform is doing is providing quote unquote neutral tools in the way that users uh, are matched with content. So those are the developments, a magic word, neutral tools is a magic word. Um, one other thing that came up in argument and especially uh, Justice Gorsuch really focused on this is what counts as providing an interactive computer service, any information, uh, uh, the uh, service system or access software provider, which uh, is not something I usually teach when we deal with this, but it got a lot of uh, play today, that provides or enables computer access by multiple users. So that access software provider is also a defined term. Um, and that means uh, if you provide server software and it allows for the filter screen, allow or just allow content, pick, choose, analyze, or digest, or a, a bunch of other verbs. Um, so one of the issues at the stake is when social media provides algorithms that help recommend videos to you, um, 
are they re legally responsible because that recommendation is independent of the video that was uploaded? That's the core of, of, of the debate. So with that little setup, I'm going to um, get out of the way and uh, cede this seat to Dr. Franks. Um, and I will go down to the end and introduce our panel. So just give me a minute to switch sides. You're going to have to introduce yourself. So no. All right. So I'm going to let uh, 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 Bob Tolchin was going to join us, but his uh, partner is is here instead. So Keith's going to introduce himself, and then I'll take over introducing the other panelists. Hi, my name is Keith Altman. I'm from the law office. Keith Altman. I filed the original Gonzalez complaint back in 2016. I've been working with the matter for the last almost seven years. Now to his right is Chris Moore or Christopher Moore, if you like, uh, the president of this, <laughs> okay. the Software Information Industry Association, which filed an amicus brief in, in support of the respondent. Um, and he's been at SIA previously as the uh, senior vice president and, uh, and general counsel. Um, in addition to acting as the front facing uh, advocate for an intellectual property policy, um, and he runs its anti-piracy program, Chris has also um, created their strategic filing program uh, in which the organization chooses uh, when to uh, sort of get involved and have its voice heard before the courts of appeals. Uh, to his right is Tom, sorry, I guess we're not, I've got you guys in, uh, Tom McBrien who is at the uh, Electronic Privacy Information Center. Um, and he's, a, he's a, an Epic Law Fellow, uh, and they filed a brief in support of neither party. He's a graduate of New York University Law School, where he served as the senior editor of the Journal of, on Legislation and Public Policy. Um, and he's, uh, he was a student fellow coordinator for the Privacy Research Group and the students uh, uh, chapter of the National Lawyers Guild. To his right is Dr. Marianne Franks. Um, uh, she is a professor of law and the Michael R. Klein Distinguished Scholar Chair at Miami University School of Law. Uh, she's also the president and legislative and tech policy director of the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative, a nonprofit organization dedicated to combating online abuse and discrimination. Uh, and they filed a brief uh, in this case in support of the petitioner. She's a nationally and internationally recognized expert on the intersection of civil rights and technology and has been writing for a long time. I'm now extemporizing because I know about uh, section 230 and so is a deep expert on, on our topic today. To her right is Andrew Bridges, a partner emeritus at Fenwick and West. He is the council of record for the brief of the internet infrastructure coalition uh, and a number of other uh, tech companies uh, in support of, the, of neither party. He's led and won multiple landmark court of appeals cases and has also drafted important and influential amicus briefs in a wide variety of internet and technology uh, cases. Uh, and he is the co-chair of Fenwick's copyright litigation practice. And finally, but not last but not least is uh, to his right, Thomas Berry, a research fellow at the Cato Institute's Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies, and he is the editor in chief of Cato of the Cato Supreme Court Review. Um, and uh, the brief was actually a joint brief of the Cato Institute, the R Street Institute, and Americans for Tax Reform, uh, and that their brief was uh, filed in support of the respondent. Um, prior to that, he was at the Pacific Legal Foundation and clerk for Judge E. Uh, Jolly of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Um, without further ado, I want to get to hear sort of uh, what, the, what the parties had to say. So um, we were not able to be joined by any of Google's counsel. So Mr. Bridges was uh, kind enough to basically step in and he will tell us what Google, order, uh, um, Google argued. But first we'll, we'll hear from the petitioner and tell us a little bit about what your argument was before the court. Hello everybody. So uh, today our position is when I first filed the case, it seemed that Google was going way beyond what, um, what a normal publisher would be in that it was um, directing its content at specific people based upon what they know about you and what you're looking at. They were um, placing ads. They were um, recommending additional videos. The, the bottom line is, is that they were um, <clears throat> 
trying to take what they knew about you to give you content and recommend content to you. And that just seemed to be fundamentally, uh, fundamentally wrong when it came to assisting ISIS in our perspective in uh, developing into the organization that is today. It's our perspective that without Google, ISIS would be 50 guys jumping up and down, chanting around a fire in the middle of the desert. And that would pretty much be the, the extent of them. But because of social media, ISIS was able to expand, to recruit, to radicalize, to raise money uh, in order to become the organization that they are today. And that was kind of the premise when we brought the original lawsuit. Uh, today, our argument was essentially, you know, to the extent that you can argue in front of the Supreme Court, they don't hijack whatever it is that you intend to say. I think they, they said, well, take two minutes and then, you know, they're going to take the rest of the time. And, and boy, did they take the rest of the time. Not only did they take the next um, 15 minutes of our time, but they went on probably for probably 45 minutes beyond that, just with our side of the equation. And, and the entire argument was over two and a half hours, uh, which was about twice as long as what was planned for. Uh, in any event, it, it's, it's our perspective that the recommendations um, suggesting to others that um, this is content that you would be interested in. That is what um, uh, Google and other social media companies do to expand their, uh, e expand their reach and to expand the reach of others indirectly um, through this. Uh, Google was aware that ISIS was using their platform. Uh, they had been advised of this many times by many different individuals at many different levels. And so one could not say that Google simply was just surprised that ISIS was using their platforms. And so, uh, we came in argument showing that ISIS, uh, that uh, Google was aware of ISIS's content. I don't think there's any question that there is substantial ISIS content on the platform. And so the whole issue here is, is by recommending it to you, are you um, getting outside of Section 230, which is, you know, talks about liability if you are a publisher and recommending content to people based upon what you know about them is not publishing in our view. That goes to a whole nother level. It's not an essential element of publishing. It never has been. Uh, in terms of uh, the questions that were asked, it's very, very clear. We're, gonna, we're just gonna get the substance first and then okay. we're gonna do another round. Okay, that's fine. To the argument. Okay, <laughs> Sorry that's to fine. No problem. All right, uh, so very briefly, thank you. That was very brief and I, that's what we want at this round. Um, so Andrew, just very quickly, um, what was the uh, respondent's position on, on section 230 here? Sure, first I'd like to say one thing. I thought all of the principal arguments uh, were quite short. The lawyers spoke for a few minutes and then cut uh, cut back and said, we'd be happy to take questions. Uh, it was shorter than I sort of expected it to be, honestly. Um, but the Google, let me make sure it's clear, I don't represent Google, I didn't represent Google in this. I filed an amicus brief supporting Google, uh, but I'm channeling what I saw from Google's counsel there, which is first, she said that uh, publication is any type of communication of any type of information and that section 230 should provide protection for claims where the harm is alleged to flow from the information. And then uh, she said, she acknowledged that targeted recommendations are prioritization based on what is known about the users and about the context. Uh, she was concerned that plaintiffs can always artfully plead around what was assumed to be the core protection of Section 230, which is the provision of information itself by claiming that it was simply the prioritization of the information already available on the website that would establish a claim. Uh, she said that all publication involves organization of some sort. And if we use a newspaper analogy, a newspaper has to decide what goes on page one and what goes on page 20. Uh, if you decide to, to rank posts by reverse chronological order, that's a form of organization as well. So she was trying to say organization is no separate, is not separate from the provision of the information itself. Uh, 
she said that uh, this represented a, a, a conscious decision by Congress in enacting the law to prevent lawsuits that would stifle the growth of the internet in its infancy. Um, and that uh, alluding to 230F4, um, it's inherent in an interactive service, she didn't phrase it quite that explicitly, for services to pick and choose uh, and to subset material and the like, um, and to organize and reorganize material. That's the essence of interactivity. So when you're providing protection for interactive computer services, you don't lose protection because of those actions. And uh, she was saying that uh, finding needles in a haystack is an essential function of the internet. Those are, that's really the capsule summary of the argument. I will say this, I was struck during the questions how frequently justice is moved from social media targeted recommendations to Google search and the ranking of search results uh, by Google search as an analogy. Thank you. Um, so I'm not telling you what I argued. I mean, I hope I have a chance to. Yeah, well, let, so let's just go down the line then and, and we'll let each. Um, so uh, one thing to note, this case, one signal for how important this case is, is the number of uh, amicus briefs that were attracted on both sides. There were, and the court not made mention of this multiple times, that the, the, the stakes are quite high. Uh, and I think the court got that. So we have with us only a small subset of the friends of the court. Um, and and on, the, on the petitioner side, there was substantial uh, focus on the various kinds of harm that, that these recommendation algorithms can, can pr produce, not just in connecting people with terrorist content, but, but uh, other kinds of content. And of course, large, uh, a number of supporters of the tech industry uh, supported Google's position. So this, you know, there was just a lot of action, but among the panelists that we have, uh, Chris, you represent a group of these technology companies. So why don't you start us off with your position? Sure. Thanks. Um, I think, you know, uh, to riff a bit off of what Michael was talking about, as, as an amicus here, uh, one of the things you, the first thing you wonder when you see something like this is, okay, why did the court take this case and what could go wrong? Um, and uh, from our perspective, uh, quite a bit. Uh, <clears throat> we, as an amicus, one of the luxuries is you do not have to answer every part of the question presented. You get to pick and choose which parts uh, of the kind of legal framework and other frameworks you want to emphasize. So for us, it was pretty straightforward. Uh, it was, <clears throat> we believe that there were uh, a lot of folks who were going to cover different types of parade of horribles. For us, it seemed as a group that uh, is dedicated to what we call the, in, to the information life cycle, at least as we've defined it, which is a healthy environment for its creation, dissemination, and productive use. There were a couple of things that were really important. The most important thing was that these recommendation, uh, these recommendations are a way that is indistinguishable functionally from search for from finding relevant information in an unstructured data set. So from our point of view, they were the same thing. And that was apparent. The, the parallels between those two things. This, came, this did come up in argument. I'm sure we're going to get into all kinds of stuff. Uh, but the parallels between the uh, problems that were identified, for example, in academic literature in 1992, you know, still existed in 1996, and they still exist now. Uh, they're just being solved with uh, better processors and at a much, much, much higher scale. Uh, the from the pure you know from the pure legal side uh, we were um, emphasizing section uh, F4. I keep wanting to say A4 and I don't know why. Um, and I've been doing that since November. Um, in and its definition of uh, access software provider, uh, which in our view sort of. Uh, on a essentially on kind of a surplusage argument, right? If you if you read the the statute the way petitioners have suggested that it should be read, <clears throat> the the access software provision and much of the protection 
there and uh, in C1 becomes a dead letter. Um, and the cost of that reading would be, you know, in our view, a, a large amount of litigation that is not really going to fall as much on Google, who can handle it, um, because they've got the checkbook to do it. It is on smaller folks uh, that will not be able to afford uh, the cost of that litigation or, uh, you know, or the realistically the cost of insuring against that litigation. And I'll stop there. Hey, everyone. So in our amicus brief, uh, we filed in support of neither party, but our overall org argument was in support of a more narrow reading of Section 230, which we believe to have been the original intent when the law was drafted. Um, so I would say our argument overall supports the petitioner's claims more than the respondents. I'll just pull out a few of the main points of our brief and why we felt comfortable making that argument. Um, to illustrate a lot of these points, I'll talk about a case that happened in the Second Circuit a while back. Uh, we participated as amicus in that case too. It's called Herrick versus Grinder. Um, some of you may have heard of this case briefly. What happened in the case was a man <clears throat> sued the hookup app Grinder, um, alleging a variety of claims, including products liability. What had happened was an ex of his had been making fake profiles on the website uh, of him saying, my biggest fantasy in the world is surprise rape sex and I will give you drugs if you provide this to me. He had dozens of men coming to his home and work uh, every day, over a thousand over the course of a few months, um, following up on these profiles. The same activity was happening on other hookup apps as well, but they had procedures. When he notified them this was happening, they implemented industry standard things like identity verification, IP address blocking, et cetera. Grindr simply wouldn't. And so the thrust of his product's liability claim was that this was an unreasonably dangerous product. Unfortunately, the case was pretty summarily kicked out by the Second Circuit on 230 grounds saying, uh, you would not and could not have brought this suit without Grindr's activity, which flowed from its status as a publisher. It was publishing these fake accounts. You're trying to hold it liable for not taking them down. We think that's a wrong result and the tr true cost of Section 230. Uh, Section 230 provides benefits, especially a properly scoped interpretation of it. But these are the kind of costs that a really expansive reading of Section 230 provides. And we think the problematic part is that it's being used to immunize companies' own behaviors. Here, a decision not to implement certain safety features. Google and certain Amici warned that with a more narrow reading of Section 230, we will see this flood of liability and litigation that will force companies either to over-censor or retract services altogether. But I think what this case shows is there's already a lot of built-in protections in the law. In product liability, you can't just say this product harmed me, ergo you lose. If that were the case, then yes, we would probably worry a lot about products liability suits against these companies. Instead, there are built-in protections like showing a reasonable alternative design or that consumers' reasonable expectations were violated by the design of this tool. That defense, along with other very robust defenses like First Amendment defenses, uh, heightened pleading standards from Plumlee and Iqbal, uh, there's kind of a constellation of protections we think makes us not as worried about this flood of litigation uh, uh, concerns, this parade of horribles. Um, and so I'll just, I guess I'll leave off with that. Um, trying to separate in people's minds a lack of automatic immunity from the imposition of enormous amounts of liability without questioning, what would that claim be? Would that claim work? Would, uh, if a company organized its behavior in reverse chronological order, what kind of claim would be brought trying to seek that liable? These are the kind of questions I think we need to ask when anticipating whether there's going to be enormous amounts of liability with a narrower reading of 230. Um, I'd be happy to talk a little bit more about the exact tests we proposed for whether a claim is immunized or not, but maybe we can save that for a bit later. Thanks. Okay. Professor Franks. Thanks. Uh, the amicus brief that we wrote on behalf of the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative is also on behalf of myself and Daniel Keith Citroen, whose work many of you may know. And it really goes back in some ways to Professor Carroll's first slide about, you know, what's at issue here? What is Section 230 about? And what you saw, and mostly you get 
that talked about is the C1 language, right? That part about you shouldn't treat interactive computer service providers as publishers or speakers. What we emphasize in our brief is that that's only part of the statute and an equally, if not more important part of the statute is C2. C2 is the part of the statute that says that you will not actually be, uh, that you are given immunity from civil liability if you engage in certain actions that you take voluntarily and in good faith to restrict access to harmful content. So what we do in our brief is we say, we need to step back from this conversation about what counts as publishing, what is an editorial function, all of those things to some extent are beside the point. If we look at the text and the legislative history of section 230, it is literally called a Good Samaritan statute. So that is the operative provision title, Good Samaritan protections for blocking and screening of offensive material. Now, just to take a little detour as to what a Good Samaritan statute normally does, in the 1990s, it was clear what a Good Samaritan statute does. It essentially provides an incentive for people to offer assistance when they don't have to. It's that simple. So if someone is having a heart attack and you don't know that person and you're not responsible for that person, the idea is that if you know CPR, you would in fact maybe offer CPR because you would not have to worry about getting sued in case you do it wrong, in case something else happens. The Good Samaritan statute that exists in essentially every jurisdiction in the United States is exactly that kind of law. Here is an incentive that is to say the benefit of not getting sued if you do something that you are not obligated to do that attempts to help someone. Now, if that is the title of the statute, if that is what the legislators at the time were saying, this is what we are trying to do for the internet, what are they trying to say? They're saying there are so many bad things on the internet, and this is 1996, right? So, so many things have gotten worse, but even then to say there are so many bad things and there are going to be so many disincentives for these companies to do anything about it. So we would like to have a good Samaritan law for the internet, that's C2. Now, the point that we are making about the questions in C1 about publishers and treating as speakers, we argue has got to be read in a way that is coherent in terms of it being a good Samaritan statute, which is to say, if you read C1 as saying, you can have the benefit of civil immunity if you don't do anything to help. You can have the benefit of civil immunity if you actually encourage the help. You, sorry, encourage the harm. You can have this kind of immunity if you actually profit from the harm. If we imagine how that would work in terms of an offline Good Samaritan statute, it would obviously be unintelligible. The idea that you would say, hey, you person who have voluntarily intervened to give assistance, you get a benefit, but also the bystander that just stands back and does nothing, you get a benefit. And the guy that goes through the poor man's pockets while he's unconscious, you also get a benefit. So our argument is that there is no way you can interpret C1 of the statute in the way that the tech industry largely has in the sense of what we call essentially a kind of unqualified immunity that would not render it inconsistent as a good Samaritan statute. And that the consequences of that are extremely serious. That the status quo, far from being a kind of ideal mix of good speech and what have you, or democracy or whatever the argument is, that the status quo incentivizes, it incentivizes tech companies to be reckless because they will never have to pay for being reckless. And in fact, what we know, what we know from whistleblower documents, we don't know this from so many cases because 230 keeps us away from discovery, but what we know from whistleblowers and reporting is these companies really do know that the harmful content that they promote on their platforms is going to be the really profitable content. And so they have made conscious choices in the past being fully aware of the harm that is going to flow from those actions and have done it anyway because it means more profit. Now, if that's going to be the kind of qualified, unqualified immunity that Section 230 gives, then you can see how it is that it's not only defeating a Good Samaritan purpose, it is actually perversely incentivizing the opposite. So those are the kinds of concerns that one has, especially when the argument from the side of, let's say, Google and others is, this is the best of all possible worlds, and you don't want to change the status quo because that would break the internet. The response being the internet is broken, at least for the people who have suffered, died, been attacked, been threatened, had their um, privacy uh, violated, have had pictures of them released without their consent. For those people, the internet isn't actually working. So in addition to the point that was made before about the difference between whether or not you get immunity from the statute and how that does not mean necessarily that you are responsible for everything. 
If it, we find that you are not going to get immunity for a certain kind of action, that doesn't mean that you suddenly become responsible for the harm. It would be like saying, look, we're not going to let the passive bystander get good Samaritan immunity for the guy who's having a heart attack because you didn't do anything to help, but you're also not suddenly responsible for the heart attack. You would have to do something else. There would have to be some other kind of blameworthy action on your part before we could really talk about liability. And to the question, a lot of litigation that you have to be worried about, it's worth underscoring is essentially every industry other than the tech industry all has to face. Us as individuals in this room have far fewer resources than Google or the smallest internet. We would also have to face comment someone else said. And so it's important that the immunity is being given six tech industry and the idea is clearly when we look at the other industry. One thing that disturbs me that it got so little airtime in all the public discourse before today, but Justice Barrett flagged it, is this. This statute protects big tech and small tech and users equally. If the court is going to change the protection for providers of, in, of these interactive computer services, there is no way of applying a rule to them that does not equally apply to users because it's entirely parallel in the statute. And that means if, if protection gets cut back, that means users will be liable for sharing an article from, from online on a Facebook account. They would be liable for forwarding an email message that came to them. They may be liable for uh, retweeting they may be liable for liking because those are deliberate prioritization actions, conscious, deliberate prioritization by users, which to me would be far more inflammatory than the automated algorithmic prioritization. And, and unless somebody can explain why the Supreme Court could, in a principled fashion, change the rule when the law says, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated, then I, I, I can't understand why it's not a serious risk to all users of the internet, particularly users who might be vulnerable to threats of litigation, maybe users at the margin. This statute protects them. That's number one. Number two, that, that I don't like the phrase, and we, we objected to the phrase. Let me back up for a second. I represent an internet infrastructure companies, but given all of the bad arguments we saw for the petitioners in the case, they went far beyond what their parochial concern was because they're concerned about the health of 230 as a whole, not just how it affects them because it affects the internet as a whole, which ends up affecting all the players. One of the problems is this phrase targeted recommendations. It really sounds like some conscious you know, targeting. I'm taking you and you as a person, uh, I'm, I'm recommending um, that you do something. No, it was, it was a feed. It was a prioritized feed based on how a user had interacted with the system, what clicks occurred, other data available about online behavior of the user, but it's really just prioritization. And, and what's the alternative to it? So you go to YouTube and you see, you get a Lou Reed uh, song. Now, is, you, is YouTube not supposed to suggest anything to you? Or instead of suggesting a David Bowie song to you, it should suggest a video on how to plant marigolds. That's not what users want when they go to these places. So the prioritization isn't some uh, sinister uh, target. This is not recommendation that people go out and commit terrorism. This is if you are interested in video A, you may like or be interested in video B. Second, uh, Miki for the plaintiffs and the plaintiffs kept saying that there's just unlimited 
uh, immunity under Section 230. In our brief, I filled an entire page and just stopped there, fine print footnotes of all the decisions that have in fact found in certain circumstances, no immunity uh, for service providers. So the concept of unlimited immunity did not exist. And then finally, I'll, I'll address this. Uh, some amici suggested, well, there should be no, um, no protection if you know or should have known that something is bad. I want to drill on that in a second, because what are we talking about knowledge? Because somebody writes to Google and says, this is defamatory. What, what does Google know about that? This is not just a matter of scale, folks. This is a matter of competence. If I put up a one, uh, if I run a social media network where one lucky person gets to post per month and I and somebody posts a, a, a statement about a member of Congress being a pedophile. And I get a letter saying, that's defamatory, take it down. Now, how am I supposed to determine that as a service provider? I don't have subpoena power. I don't have discovery power. How am I supposed to validate whether it is defamatory or not? The problem of competence is huge. And this is analogous to uh, the, the Sony Betamax case in copyright law, which was actually more of a knowledge case than a copyright case. The question in Sony Betamax is, is Sony chargeable with actual knowledge of infringement because its product is capable of, uh, because its product is capable of infringement and people are gonna use it for infringement, maybe statistically likely to use it for infringement. And the Supreme Court has not gone there. It said, no, it's not going to be charged with knowledge so long as the product is capable of substantial non-infringing use. Now let's say that there's a, a Syrian uh, terrorist at attack uh, on YouTube. Um, what do I know about that? I don't know whether that is uh, somebody um, who is documenting Syrian war crimes, or whether this is somebody who is saying rah, 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 are 9-11 videos versus Christchurch massacre videos? Is some of them, are some of them promoting terrorism versus displaying the horrors of terrorism? Do we know why somebody is searching? Do we know that this is a, an impressionable 18-year-old kid in some foreign country who might, uh, who, who might, uh, be incentivized to commit murder, or maybe it's an 18-year-old student journalist in the foreign country. Andrew, probably, we're, we're not in court. <laughs> okay. All right. But anyway, those those are the issues. The knowledge question is a huge one that that I think uh, has not been addressed sufficiently, but it's certainly in our brief. Thanks. Great. Thanks. And Tom, finish this off because I do want to get to the argument. There was a lot to talk about. Absolutely. All right. So I'll be brief. Uh, the Cato Institute's uh, amicus brief touched on a few topics. One of the most important is that this is, even though Section 230 has been around since 1996, this is the first time it's reached the Supreme Court. And so we have a ton of uh, Court of Appeals decisions that have kind of built up various uh, lingo and shorthand terms, but not all of those are uh, connected to the text. And so we wanted to remind the court that the shorthand terms the courts of appeals have developed are not themselves the test or the operative legal requirements. It's the actual text of the statute itself. The main one we focused on is this uh, term called traditional editorial functions test um, that was in one of the very first section 230 cases. And even, even though that can be useful uh, to look at the statutory question, which is, is this claim treating the defendant as a publisher? Sometimes courts, in our view, have gone too far and sort of looked at, well, what is the business model of a publishing company or, or things like that? Uh, a specific example was a dissent by the late Judge Katzman of the Second Circuit in a case called Force versus Facebook, which really put on the map for the first time this, this argument that recommendations are not, not protected by Section 230. And Judge Katzman's dissent uh, put a lot of weight on this traditional edit editorial functions phrase as if that was sort of the determinative factor. So he said, although it can be useful, it shouldn't replace the fundamental question, which is, is this treating the defendant as a publisher uh, of the speech uh, at issue that allegedly caused the harm? A uh, second main issue uh, that we focused on um, 
was the, uh, again, the issue of who is most likely to be harmed by this big tech versus small tech. Um, we focused on, in our view, there is a fundamental difference between the business model of tech versus other types of companies. There is a plausible reason why uh, tech is different and does need to be treated different legally, that the orders of magnitude of the sheer amount of data, sheer amount of submissions they get on a daily basis really just isn't comparable to any other business or any other individual that we can imagine or that have ever existed before. And so, um, you know, even if Google or the giant tech can probably survive the amount of liability here, uh, that, that it's, it's unlikely that smaller tech companies would. And we pointed out the difference between the US and, and other European countries that don't have a Section 230 model. They also have about one tenth of the lawyers per capita that the United States does. Um, so it's simply being liable to be sued, even if you can potentially win at an early stage, it's a lot more expensive just to be sued in the United States than it is uh, in most other countries. Uh, and then uh, finally, we, we focused on this issue of neutrality, um, which has gotten a lot of debate of should that matter at all. The Ninth Circuit, it's unclear how much they hung their hat on this or whether it was just a throwaway line, but they said that the algorithm was neutral. It, wasn't intentionally promoting ISIS. No one at Google or YouTube wanted to promote ISIS, but there is a question of, okay, so what? Isn't the logical extension of Google's argument that even if they did like ISIS, that would still be protected by Section 230, just like the newspaper editor that wants to put a story above the fold. And we essentially said, yes, it usually does not matter, but it can be relevant in a few instances the court should keep in mind. For example, there's an exemption for illegal uh, conduct. Uh, and so if and uh, if you're non-neutral and the point of that is that you're actually promoting illegal uh, speech or conduct, then that can uh, uh, waive Section 230 protection. And also we said that uh, we essentially agreed with a court of appeals decision called Roommates, which was where uh, a, a website actively encouraged people to, fill, to ask for only roommates of particular sex and gender, which is illegal. They essentially promoted or helped develop the illegal conduct that was being uploaded. Um, and we argued that in those cases where an algorithm is not neutral and it's essentially guiding uh, the user uh, to help and helping to create the recommendation, then that combination of a non-neutral algorithm uh, into some sort of new content could potentially be, be void Section 230 protection uh, because it's not uh, it's no longer just information provided by the user. Um, but we we argued that neither of those uh, rare exceptions for non-neutrality are are present in this case. Right. So. The court only took one, heard one case today. They normally hear two. They set 70 minutes aside for argument and they took over two hours. Uh, the council ended their arguments early and said, we welcome your questions. And boy, did the justices have questions. Uh, so he's, uh, I mean, there's so much there, but I guess what would you treat as the, the most significant moments from your perspective? I'll just jump in and say Justice Kagan's remark that those are not the nine greatest internet experts in the world uh, was an important one. Yeah. You know, I think the, um, I think the real issue with the questions in the court was just how far does this go? I, I, I think they were troubled by coming up with a rule that, that simply says, okay, this is okay, this is not okay. Um, it was, you know, when you came to, you know, Google searches, for example, came up and <clears throat> how do you take recommendations? How do you tie that into searches? So I, I think the court focused a lot on the, the, the parameters of this. You know, they, they wanna come out with a rule. They wanna give some guidance. They, they wanna say, do this or don't do that. And <clears throat> I think they were clearly troubled by where do you draw, where, where do you draw the line? Um, I think that they never really uh, looked at the issues in the context of just the fact that this was one particular case where we were talking about terrorism and, and the context of terrorism and how does that fit. There's gonna be a case heard tomorrow which is gonna focus more on the terrorism aspect of what's going on. But they were looking at it at a much, much bigger picture. And I think they've got, I mean, they've got a lot to think about. They, it wasn't 70 minutes per side, it was 70 minutes total. Right. And they took two hours and 45 minutes, which just 
<clears throat> flabbergasted me. And then, you know, anybody that was sitting there that had to go to the bathroom and it's just, <laughs> uh, we, we, we were struggling. And me personally, I had to get up at some point and I just could not, uh, could not wait any longer. But uh, I think that was probably the feeling of most of the people. So, so I think overall, the court is really wrestling with just how big this really is, you know, and listening to, you know, all the other perspectives here. <clears throat> I mean, clearly, the to, to just look at this in the terrorism context, which is all we really brought this up in, is, is probably not good enough. But is it the big bugaboo that everybody says that I, you know, that I don't know? We'll just go down the line. Sure. Um, so, uh, so for me, I think, I mean, there were there were there were a number of significant parts. I mean, I, I, there's one piece of this that we haven't talked about yet, which is the great briefed elephant in the room. Um, and by that, I mean what the what the government says and how they do, because the government's position. Um, and I obviously am not speaking for them, so nobody come to my house angry. Um, the, uh, but the government's position was a bit more nuanced than the petitioners. And then they said, well, certain things would be out and certain things would be uh, not out and you could be liable for those. And <clears throat> what happened, there was an extended, extensive exchange with the Solicitor General's office where they really struggled to adopt their test and make it work for them. They just could not figure out how to draw the line. So I, I agree. I mean, I think that there are, there are two, there's a way you can get in trouble and there's a way you can stay out of trouble. The way, the way you can get in trouble is to say, this libelous statement is awesome and we adopt it, you're screwed. The way you stay out of trouble is by simply republishing whatever <clears throat> whatever that statement was at the direction of another narrow no embellishments no no ranking and somewhere in the middle <clears throat> somewhere inside of that line on inside of that express adoption line i think that's where they were struggling and that's where they were really struggling to find a line that would be workable realizing that there are a number of externalities that occur when you do that, and at those externalities, you know, you know, counting noses, there were at least three or four of them that were inclined to punt to Congress based on the way they acted. What does that mean to punt? <laughs> they have to do something. Congress isn't going to do anything if the court doesn't say, "Here's what the law says," and if you don't like it, Congress, you can change it. And this is Robert told you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I can answer that. I think that there's a significant chance that we're gonna see the writ dismissed as improvidently granted. That is the easiest and probably the most benign resolution here. And they all acknowledge, depending on how the Tom versus Twitter decision goes, which is likely to go in Twitter's favor, then they could say, that's the way to resolve this case. We don't have to reach 230, send it back. But they still have to reach it because one, as uh, Eric Schnapper said, once they decide what ATA provisions are. This case, Gonzalez was not up in this court on ATA. And they, they have to, if it goes back to the Ninth Circuit, plaintiff gets a chance to amend potentially to comply with whatever said in the Omni. Right, so but they, just, all right, wait, I want to hear from the sure. other panels yeah. about the arguments that we can sort of yeah. keep this conversation going. But. Uh, I'll keep it brief. I don't know if I've ever heard an oral argument where the justices express confusion as often mm -hmm. as in this one, and I get it. It is confusing. I wish this case had not come up on the ATA. I feel like that really confused things for me personally at first, for the justices today. They kept being torn back into the merits of the ATA question, mm -hmm. and I think they're justifiably disturbed by the idea of a statute that would uh paint making a recommendation as aiding and abetting terrorism that's at least my personal view but that doesn't necessarily have anything to do in our view with immunity under section 230 and that's why this is difficult um they were referencing the case tomorrow so often and i feel like just having a difficult time separating those two questions um so that was one of the big takeaways um 
definitely agree with a lot of what's already been said. So I'll leave it there. Yeah, I think I would agree with that. The one thing I think you did hear fairly consistently from the justices is that they don't think the aiding and abetting argument works. And so what is the consequence of that? I think it means something like, first of all, we think these claim, there are certain claims that we think are plausible, other ones we think are not and maybe alarming. What does that mean for the section 230 question? I think in some ways it might mean that they're saying, look, you don't need section 230 defenses to be able to get rid of bad cases. And I think that's a really important point, right? That I think Google was trying to push the idea that without section 230, oh my God, all the time, you're gonna be held accountable for these crazy theories. And the fact that the court kept wanting to say, well, isn't this just a really sort of weak case on the, on the merits is really a way of saying, you don't need section 230 here. What you need is just to look at what is being alleged here. And there just isn't that strong of a case. So I think that that's part of what I think the, the court is looking at. I was really gratified by Justice Jackson in particular, because I think she was one of the strongest voices saying, let's talk about the text and history of the statute. It is a good Samaritan statute, she used those words. Uh, she seemed very concerned about trying to actually read the statute on its own terms. And you know, to push back on this idea that if these things aren't covered, whether that's recommendations or whether it's algorithms or something else that she was saying, there's plenty of other things you can do under the statute because pretty much everyone agrees that C1 means that you can't treat uh, an interactive computer service provider or a user as though they were the speaker of someone else's content. So if you simply link to something, if you simply post something that leads to another person's speech, I think they all agree that on its face, C1 says you can't be held liable for that. And then you have C2 that says you could take all kinds of stuff down voluntarily and in good faith. So the idea that you would simply have to have a horror show, right, that's nothing but porn and spam, that doesn't make any sense because C2 explicitly says that you are protected in making those decisions. So I think that was a very sophisticated way of the court not falling for this argument, this kind of rhetoric around how if you don't read C2 in this uh, C, uh, section 230 in this really broad blanket unqualified way, you know, these companies will never be able to, um, to get off the ground, smaller companies in particular. Um, but keep in mind, smaller companies can do a lot of damage, right? Smaller companies are Gab or Parler, 4chan. And the idea that we would say, oh, well, because they're small companies and they're struggling, we should you know, let them do what they want to do because they don't have the resources of Google. I don't think we'd see that repeated in some other industry. And once again, for all of those intuitive claims made about how, oh, defamation is tricky, or we don't know about knowledge or what you should have known, or what does it mean when someone complains, that's a problem with distributor liability, which one can object to and say that shouldn't exist, but it does. And arguably the only industry that doesn't have to deal with it is the tech industry. And the question is why? Dominion v. Fox is happening right now. And if Fox had the kinds of protections that Google does, we wouldn't know anything that we have learned in the last week or so, because they would have just been able to say, hey, you know what? We're not the, the speaker of that other, of those particular guests that came on these shows and made these terrible you know, conspiracies and lies and what have you. And they would be, we would never be in court having this discussion, getting those documents. So if we think that defamation sometimes is a good thing, if we think that this is a cause of action that sometimes should be held, New York Times got sued not long ago by Sarah Palin, right? These things happen. We don't know how they're going to come out. Ultimate liability is a major question. But the idea that the tech industry uniquely needs this very special shield, right, as opposed to any other industry that is engaged in the speech business just seems um, implausible on its face. I will give a, a series of bullet points rather than extended discussion. Number one, uh, Justice Thomas roared out of the gate leaving me to wonder, this is the guy who asked for a 230 case to be brought up? He was, he seemed hostile to the petitioner's case. He, he was focused on, <laughs> he, he was, he was focused uh, really on the fact that they're neutral algorithms uh, and the like, and, and is there liability? Uh, I think one of the other justices sort of chided him a little bit saying, you know, we're sort of mixing the 230 protection versus the underlying liability and whether it's neutral or not may affect the underlying liability and the like, but that was where he came out. I would say four or five of the justices said, our heads hurt, can't, can't we send this to Congress? Uh, you know, it's, their, it's their job. Uh, I thought Justice Barrett was like a dog on a bone on the protection of users. Um, Justice Gorsuch, uh, I think there was broad, uh, views that the neutral uh, algorithm approach of the Ninth Circuit, whether it was a focus of the Ninth Circuit or incidental, I think there's uh, 
broad feeling that that doesn't work. So they're not going to adopt that uh, because Justice Gorsuch was showing uh, neutral algorithms can create material, new material. They're not just repeating. Uh, Justice Jackson was like a dog on a bone with the title of the act. And that's what she was focusing on the whole time. Uh, Justice Kagan was focused on Google search. Um, a number of justices were focused on uh, Google search and the rankings there. Uh, Justice Sotomayor seemed very concerned about letting job opportunity websites off the hook if their targeted recommendations implement discriminatory practices. Uh, so I think uh, she was very concerned about that. She doesn't want to let them off the hook for, for targeting blacks for certain jobs and whites for other jobs, per, perhaps. Um, and then um, somebody, to, to your point though, somebody pointed out that distributor liability is considered secondary publisher liability. So if you're interpreting the statute, publisher embraces both. Um, well, I think the, the last thing I'll say is I was a little surprised um, that from my perspective, pro-respondent, uh, I found, found the greatest concern to be with Justices uh, Jackson and Sotomayor. They are the most likely to rule for the petitioners. Um, and how the others break, I am not sure. Mm -hmm. I agree with most of what's been said. The, the general takeaways from uh, the argument, I, I agree that Justice Jackson seemed by far uh, the most sympathetic to the petitioners and the, the most hostile, hostile to respondent. There's an interesting statutory interpretation question here, which is to what extent should the title of a provision uh, influence how you how you interpret it? Um, do, is that an evidence of congressional intent? And even if it is, can intent you know in can can a history or an indication of intent alter the meaning of the words, the operative provisions uh, beneath that title. So that, that might be an interesting debate we see in, in the opinions when they come out. Um, I was struck that the petitioners uh, at versus the United States seem to focus on two di different theories of liability. The petitioners at le and now in oral argument, just like in their merits brief, have kind of shifted to focus more on uh, content developed by the website itself, things like URLs and thumbnails, the notion that those aren't made by the uploaders of the videos, that the website has to either pick out the thumbnail or generate the URL, and that that loses Section 230 uh, protection, whereas the United States focused a lot more on uh, the theory that I thought the original petition focused on more, which is the idea that boosting it or putting it at the top of your feed or saying up next, the act of how you arrange them and putting a certain video first so you find it uh, more easily, that that's wh where you lose um, liability. And it seemed to me that the justices were more sympathetic to the United States' uh, theory and, and seemed more confused um, by the petitioners focusing more on, on thumbnails and, and things like that. Um, and uh, I would say that finally, uh, there's an interesting, I was uncertain sort of how big or small this issue is the United States' argument tried to straddle this line closely by saying, on the one hand, a lot of stuff in their theory is not protected by Section 230. Anytime you sort of order something in a particular way, you can sue based on the fact that you ordered it in that way. But then they would say there are very few types of liability that are based on ordering as opposed to based on the content. So you really don't have to worry about this not being protected by 230. Um, and so again, I was I was sort of left thinking, well, is this sort of a, a, a lose-lose argument from the petitioner's point of view. In other words, how much should petitioners like the United States' theory, uh, or is it lose-lose in the sense that uh, the only way to buy it is to say, yes, it only applies very narrowly to claims that where the actual content of the video or the upload or whatever does not matter. And then in that case, it's hard for me to still see how you would have a cause of action that would say, I can sue you for putting this video up first, but this doesn't, but my theory of the case, my theory of harm does not have anything to do with what's actually in the video. And that seemed to be uh, the United States' theory, uh, that, that ordering is itself a separate, a separate thing. Yeah, if I can, because we're almost done, but I, I would just say uh, one quick observation. I think Justice Kagan sort of uh, articulated both sides of the coin. On the one hand, there's an institutional competence problem that some kind of line drawing needs to be here. Justice Sotomayor was explicit. Give me the line. I want to draw a line. I think the courts of appeals are 
uh, interpreting Section 230 too broadly, give me a line. Uh, and I don't know that any of the justices got the line that they felt comfortable enough with, because as soon as you open some liability, then they wanted to know, well, what does that lawsuit look like? What, how frequently will it be brought? How expensive will it be? And they didn't, I didn't get a sense that they were uh, comfortable with the answers they were getting, but I, just a quick last, uh, anyone willing to predict the lineup? I mean, so one option is they can dismiss as improvidently granted, in which case they will get no decision on section 230. If we get a decision, anyone willing to predict the outcome? Or <laughs> Eight to one for the respondent with Justice Jackson dissenting. Yeah. Not Alito. I, I thought oh, Justice yeah. Alito was pretty uh, petitioner friendly. Um, my guess is uh, five to three with one concurrence with the five uh, tagging along. Um, I'm sorry, uh, increase that by one. Uh, Six to two with one concurrence with the six, probably. That would be Kagan, Direction. probably. Who are the two? Uh, the two would be Jackson and Sotomayor. Yeah. I think oh, for respondents, the, respondent. the majority for the respondent. Yeah. But I, actually, I would put my money on a dig. Okay, that's dis dismissed as improvidently granted. Yeah. All right, there's lots more. I'm sorry we didn't move to audience questions, but this was a big case. Big argument, lots of stuff going on. We have a reception outside for those of you who are in the room. For those of you on the internet, um, it's not Star Trek yet. I can't be <laughs> uh, But thank you for joining us. Please join us online again uh, uh, tomorrow at five for the Twitter piece of this case. And please give a warm round of applause to all of us.